Hello, everyone. Um, the first lecture to, of today is going to be Claire Bernat. Um, she's a group leader at the University of Tübingen, and before she was at DeepMind, and I think that she also held a position at Amazon. Um, and basically, her research interests are theoretical aspects of bandits and reinforcement learning. And she's going to talk today about uh, contextual bandits, so let's welcome her. Cool. Now it works. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for making it to the 9:30 a.m. morning lesson on bandits after after a no, like a week of of uh, reinforcement learning classes and probably long nights or short nights. Um, so today we're going to talk about contextual bandits. So it's kind of an extension of uh, what Emily presented yesterday and. Like maybe also related to what Tor presented yesterday, in some, to some in, to some extent. Um, so maybe like the usual. Okay, the program for today is to kind of cover, you know, like how we go from bandits to like adding context and adding, you know, and like how do we build with contextual information in bandits? Like do bandit do bandits in structured action spaces? And uh, yeah, we'll see how to extend the optimism principle. And in general, like what are the, the main, you know, the main uh, complexity trade-offs I'm gonna talk a bit about regret bounds without like clear, you know, without detailed proofs, a little bit, but not too detailed proofs. Okay. Um, okay, the usual slides to start with a, a bandit talk. Um, a recommendation use case. So you, uh, you run a mini Netflix. You have two uh, TV series in your catalog, and you want to recommend your users which of you know, like these things they, they, might, they might like. And you know, like as a first approximation, you can just run a two-armed bandit algorithm that you saw yesterday, like typically UCB. So you have customers coming, let's say that they are an IID crowd, and you just want to maximize you know, like what they click on, something like this. Two arm bandit is fine. Um, so that we know how to solve. But now you have a slightly larger catalog. You have more arms, but it seems like these arms have a bit of like similarity. And if you would run a K arm bandit problem, like a four arm bandit, a four arm bandit algorithm here, it feels like you know you'd be losing on some some information. Like you you'd be relearning things, and you don't really know you know um, like how to, yeah, reuse the fact that if someone likes Emily in Paris, very likely they're gonna they're gonna also like Emily in Paris season two. Okay, and moreover, uh, you have different kinds of customers, right? So. Like I come and I come to the your, to your platform and I ask for a recommendation. Um, you know, I'm a woman. I'm French. You know, I don't know. I like hiking. Whatever. Like I have a vector of cookies, and whatever pr represents me. And now you want to make me make a representation, and you still have like a structured action space. So the question we're going to address today is kind of how can you re resolve this question using bandit tools. Um, that are a little bit more elaborate than than uh, than K arm bandits. Okay, is the set of about the problem kind of? It's a toy problem. You can imagine that, like in gen, like in all applications, there is like much more coming into in your way. But let's just like dumb it down and model like take the simplest model. Okay, let's introduce some, some math uh, to work with this. So your observations are context. So contexts are like some some vector of cookies or something like it's my my uh, my representation as a customer, and you have actions, and uh, you you have action sets. So here you have a finite action sets. We, we we will always have only k actions, but each action is a vector in is going to be represented as a vector in in some dimension space. I'm gonna 
build that like slowly. But for now, you can kind of understand this context as a vector, these actions as a vector, and the reward as like some function, some scalar function of the context and the and the action you took you took. So the reward is a noisy thing. So whenever you take an action A in a context C, you observe some reward with some distribution P that depends on the context and the action. And in all of this talk, we're going to focus on, the re on minimizing the regrets. So I think yesterday you heard a bit about like best arm identification and other, you know, but like here we are, we are minimizing the regret, where here the regret is defined as the expectation of the difference of the, the sum of the maximum rewards you could have obtained by taking the best action in every round T, in every context C. So here really I maximize the action for the random context CT, which is observed. And we define like, so the, that's the baseline and the, your, your, your performance is just the sum of the rewards you obtain by taking actions. And this expectation here is over the randomness of the rewards and the randomness of the actions, the action sequence that you took, which also depends on the reward and the context that you observed and everything. So there's a lot of randomness in there. That's what this expectation stands for. Okay, it's not much different from like the, the regret you saw yesterday. So if you're familiar with regret definitions, that should not, okay, weird. Okay, I hope hopefully it's weird that it doesn't, Okay, so it's not much different from what you saw yesterday. Okay, um, we're going to assume that for for now, let's 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 suppose like a very simple setting where you actually have a finite amount of context. Let's say a finite amount of customers in your customer base, which is usually the case. There's rarely infinite amounts of customers. But so uh, like the first thing you can do is to say, okay, every customer is a different person. We're gonna just treat them all independently and make like a bandit algorithm for each of them. So it means that like every time you see a customer, you instantiate, you 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 recall all the data for that customer, and like you just like do one step of UCB. And if you do this, well, you have uh, we know that for each each uh, bandit algorithm that you run, like typically UCB, the worst case regret is like of the order of square root nk. And so overall, the worst case regret for that thing where you have m instances of bandit algorithm is of the order of square root n m k. I just like spelled out the computation for you here, but like overall, you know, you sum the, the you sum this these regrets and like the worst case, the worst thing that the environment can do is to show show you square root n over m times like each of the context, like each of the users, like you, every user has a certain amount of, of participation and then you, in the end you, you, you get like this square root nmk. And it's bad. It's bad because m can be really large. Also, you don't cross learn. Like if two customers are very, very similar, you actually don't use this here. So like we're not satisfied with having one bandit per context. So what are we going to do? We're gonna make assumptions. So first recall that like the linear product, the scalar product is just the sum of the xi, xi yi. I think most of you are familiar with this. And now we're going to assume that my context and my actions can be embedded into a structured like into, into RD, in, into a, a, a um, yeah, a Euclidean, uh, Euclidean space. And you have a scalar product on this space, and now your so your your five functions sends uh, sends your contextualized actions into R D, and the reward that you observe for context C and action A is simply the scalar product of this embedding and an unknown vector theta star in R D as well. So now I've simplified the problem. I've made it linear. I've, by assuming that things are embedded. And turns out that like, we're gonna make this a very strong observation here, which is that actually this is kind of all you need. Like 
if you say my actions, my context and my actions come in a, a kind of arbitrary way and I uh, embed them into, into, some, into some space, it's as if I was just saying that my actions at every realm, my action set, is an arbitrary set of k vectors. They are the contextualized action. So I abstract away this, this embedding. You can think of it as like you have a neural network, you learn representations of things, you, you take context, you take actions, and this neural network outputs a d-dimensional vector that represents this contextualized action for this context and all the k actions of your vector. I'm gonna, rec I'm gonna come back on, on, on the exact setting, but like, what, like the, the key observation here is it's equivalent to say I have a neural network that represents my context and my actions, and at every round, I get k d-dimensional action vectors. And now I can work with just linear rewards. That's an assumption. In all generality, you could say, okay, I can work with you know, a, a reward function for each action. That's kind of beyond what we are gonna talk about today, but some people are looking at this question. But here, um, we're going to just spell out everything we know about the linear reward setting. Does this make sense so far? Okay. So the, the like implicitly here, I'm saying that D really is span, RD is spanned by my action spaces. If your actions would actually be, you know, kind of ill-defined Ill and like they would actually be in a smaller dimensional space and this theta star vector would actually be zero in some places, you would have a sparse problem. It's not our problem. It's also beyond what we talk about today. There is work on this as well, but this is not what we're gonna, going to talk about today. Today, the d-dimensional space is nicely spanned by the, I don't know why this is doing this. It's my computer that locks because it doesn't understand that I'm clicking. It's okay, I'm gonna. Um, okay, so uh, the space is spanned, so it means that I can you know, observe scalar products with, of theta star with the, all the di directions of the space. All right, so how does the learning works? Uh, at every round, I observe a contextualized action space that I denote AT, AT, and the learner takes one of them and observes a noisy reward. So here I made your drawing in dimension two with K equals four actions. So this is the unknown, like the high hidden reward vector. And at this round, I observe these four vectors that are bounded, whose norm is bounded. And whenever uh, you know, I observe, uh, I, I'm going to pull this arm here, which is the contextualized vector, the like context, contextualized action. Um, and I will observe the scalar, the scalar product with um, like, so this is like here is gonna kind of represent the scalar product of the action. So it's like roughly this quantity here that you're going to observe, plus, by no, plus some noise, some um, bound, like some Gaussian noise, let's say, uh, centered Gaussian noise or sub Gaussian noise. Um, and yeah, and the, the sequence of action, well, maybe that's something I can, yeah. So this here that happened to me, like this 80, for now I've made no assumptions on them. So it's an arbitrary set of vector. And perhaps like one simple example of such like actions that is when like action one, there's only two actions, and action one is the canonical vector one, and action two is the canonical vector two. So whenever you pull action one, what you observe is just theta one, and when you, plus noise, and when you pull action two, you observe theta two plus noise. And so this is a two arm bandit, like the exact same as you saw yesterday. So my my problem is just a generalization with more actions in, a, in you know in the structuralization space of the of the KR bandit, where actions can actually be correlated. So it's exactly this modeling of having correlated actions. Okay. But there are other possibilities. Like basically, there are like three big families of 
problems of like uh, cases where uh, for the, the families of action sets that you get. The first, the first one is uh, where, which, which is maybe the most general one, is where this action set is just arbitrarily changing at every round. So like I said before, it's going to be some neural network that you don't control or some black box representation that like embedding that you, that you have. And this is, you, you have no control on these action sets and we would call it like finite harmed stochastic contextual bandits. But you may also assume that you, know, you, have, a f you have a fixed set of arms and they are never changing. At every round, AT is going to be the exact same set of vectors. So from the beginning onward, you always, you know what is going to be your action set and how you can plan your pooling of the actions to optimize the information that you, that, that you get. So this is really different to this first setting where here, you know, you don't, at every round, you need to do with whatever you're given and you know, the environment could be arbitrarily nasty. It could actually show you actions that don't bring you enough information and like we're gonna see that this, this makes this problem in general harder than the second one. And the third one is when all the, not only do you have a fixed set of vectors, but on top of it, they're normed and like orthogonal to each other and then we come back to the, the KRM bandit. Okay. So we are mostly going to talk about this case A and B because you al already saw the case C uh, in, in the, the past classes, in yes, Emily's class. Okay. So we are going to you know, build on what you've seen so far, so optimism. Um, and what does optimism tell us? Uh, you should, at, you know, at, at round T, uh, every time you, you, know, you have to take an action, you should choose the best action in the best plausible environment. So we are going to use this idea of building plausible environments through confidence bounds, so here is going to be like the freak, like for now I'm talking about the frequentist algorithm that's based on, on UCB. So plausible environments. I'm going to build um, confidence ellipsoids, which are these like kind of regions, like convex regions around an estimator. So confidence ellipsoids who, uh, whose probability of containing thetas, of not containing the true parameter is very small. So just like you saw yesterday, except that now we are in a d-dimensional space and we have information in all the directions. So like our confidence bounds, they have to kind of cover all that space. And so um, we, we are going to build confidence regions like this. I'm gonna show you how. And then how do we act? Well, we act op optimistically. So we find for, um, for any action A, we find the theta tilde that maximizes like the scalar product within the confidence region. So that's the maximal possible value for that action. And then we take the action A that has the largest optimistic value. And that's it. That's kind of the algorithm. So you're missing a lot of things. You're missing how to construct this and how to compute these things but that's kind of the, the overall idea. Yes, there are questions. Yeah, so here, yeah, the theta tilde T depends on A. Yes, really doesn't want. Yeah, here I build an optimistic value for the action A. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, why this um, ellipse with the geometrical shape? Is it just for illustration, or no? Or? It's actually it does have a geometrical shape. It's it ha it has the shape of an ellipsoid, um, and that's a good question. Hold on it. We are going to construct it in like a minute. So basically, it's it's a. It's a ellipsoid that has a center. The center is an estimator of the true parameter that I'm going to build with you. And it has a radius. And, and it's this radius is directional. 
like in you know it depends on where you look but yeah that's 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 an important point yeah it should be not uniform it's a little bit not very yeah maybe i could have made this even even more like skewed but like it is a little bit wider this way than than this way or at least that's how i I had planned to draw it, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it should be non-uniform and it's also a very important point. So good question because like the, this is, so this is the direction of the, tr the best arm. So you're going to pull, like if your algorithm works by design, it's going to pull much more actions that point this direction than this direction. So your uncertainty on this direction should be much larger than this one. So your ellipsoid should be like uh, like ill-conditioned. I don't know how to yeah say this. Yeah. Okay. So let's just build this. Um, since you know we've you, we've had very good questions, that's nice transition to the next the, the next steps. Okay. So um, to build this, we have a very good tool which is called linear regression. So I think most of most of you know about this. Here I'm going to do like regularized linear regression. Um, and so, I mean, you see scalar products of the vector theta in different directions of the space, AT. So at a certain round T, you have a collection of feature vectors and labels, RTs, R, 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 RS, like observations. So like you want to minimize this squared loss, which is um, L2 regularized for some lambda parameter. You minimize this cost function here. So if you've never done it, it's worth com computing it once. It's a little like you, you differentiate from theta, you obtain, and then you zero out, and you obtain a closed form solution, which um, basically is written this way. So uh, theta hat is some invert matrix matrix here times uh, a weighted vector or a weighted sum of the, the actions you've taken. And this matrix here is um, what we call like the design matrix or the covariance matrix. Like it's like A, A transpose. So it's a D by D matrix like this that we, we sum, we stack and sum, plus a regularization term like on the diagonal that makes everything nice and and uh, you know invertible. This is a symmetric matrix, so it also has the nice properties, um, like yeah, of kind of defining if you want a scalar product. And um, we're gonna so this gives us like for a certain sequence of action, it gives us an estimator of the true value of theta star with some uncertainty in some directions on the space. And the problem here that is that we are gonna want to, to control the uncertainty. To control the uncertainty of, um, maybe I could just do this sometimes. To control the uncertainty over theta, theta star, a uh, theta hat, but to control this uncertainty, we have a problem, which is that this design here is random because at every round I pull an action that depends on everything I've seen and done before. So like this, there is this sequence of, of dependency between like actions in my design space and that kind of blocks me from using all sorts of nice IID theorems. I have to work harder to get the, the concentration inequalities. Okay. So this is where I'm going to like only you know, draft the ideas of how to build this confidence, uh, this confidence bound. So, um, like I said earlier, we're going to define confidence ellipsoids. So, here I define a scalar product, a new like for any vector v and symmetric positive definite, definite matrix M. I define a generalized scalar product or generalized norm as V M V transpose which gives me like a way of measuring the norm of a vector di directionally, like in different, you know, like if, if the matrix M, you can think of it as a diagonal matrix. If it has a large 
eigenvalue on one direction is going to blow up the value of V in this direction, right? And if it has a small eigenvalue in one direction, it's going to make this, this value of V in that direction smaller, right? So this is a way of computing a norm that depends on, on the shape of this matrix, of this, uh, this uh, symmetric definite matrix here. And the way I'm going to use it is by saying I'm going to consider all the vector thetas that are at a distance from theta star. But this distance is not measured as like a normal scalar product, but according to the eigenvalues of the matrix VT lambda, this design matrix that contains the actions, you know, in the different directions. So just this is the matrix VT lambda. So it has some lambda in all directions. So that's equal. And then if you pull more actions in one direction, then the, the, if you want the eigenvalue or the eigenvalues of, of VT in this direction become bigger, right? Okay. And I just say the radius or the squared radius of this ellipsoid, of, of this distance, like, sorry, the square distance between theta hat and theta star with this distance must be bounded by a beta square. I'm just saying I want to consider all the thetas that are close enough with some radius, and this radius is here, close enough to theta, to theta star. Yes. Theta hat. Yes, uh, sorry, yes, it is th yes, right, that's, that's true. So, okay, um, so what you know at time t uh, is, theta, is theta hat. So you, you pick the center of this, of this ball and you say, I'll consider all the points that are, uh, yes, okay, good points. <laughs> I understand. There is no there is no star here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, forget about this star here. There is no star here. I consider all the thetas that are at some distance of theta hat, and what I'm what I'm claiming, what is the theorem here, is that actually theta star is with high probability within this ellipsoid. It's within this distance of theta hat. Thank you. Yes. Yes, there is a question over there. Uh, yeah. So where did our dependency of our features on the context go in this, sorry, in this reduction to, to this linear regression problem? So the question is, here theta star does not depend on the context. And where do, did we lose this dependency on like of the reward function from the context. Okay, so somehow we, we lost it or we, we modeled it into the, the embedding. So you can see it here, for instance. Here we said the reward function is going to be the linear product of a theta star that is unknown and that is fixed. And the reason it's fixed is that I want to cross estimate it over context and you know contextualized action spaces like i want every context to feed me into understanding what is theta star you can think of it as like supervised learning you have you have images you know and like you have a function that gives you the label compared to like for a certain image and like this function is parameterized by the theta a set of weights for your neural network maybe it's a theta vector and when you want to learn theta you take all your images and whatever the labels are and that you know you you learn you learn theta this theta is this one parameter that controls the the the, the black box function that maps features to labels here it's what happening we have we have context and actions that give us features and i observe rewards and i assume that these rewards are just a linear function of of these things Okay, so, so the thing is that our action space kind of changed. We, we're not talking about the same action space anymore, but it's, it, we added the context to it, kind of. Yeah, right. exactly. Okay, I, did, I missed that. Exactly. Thanks. No, that's, a, that's really go a good question. Like, here I make the actions, the actions change. We have contextualized action spaces. And this is, yeah, this is kind of what I try to, to say here. Like, 
having this context and these actions and giving like rewards that depend on context and actions is equivalent because I, I don't want to make assumptions on, on Psi, like on, on the, the on the the representer on the, on the embedding. So effectively for me as a decision maker, it's as if I was seeing contextualized action spaces. Right. Okay, and so this is where, you know, all I see as a learner is a sequence of vectors and a sequence of rewards. Obviously these, these vectors, uh, these action vectors are things that I've taken, but this is the only thing I have to estimate theta. So I'm gonna do linear regression to obtain it. And then um, here without the star, I, come to, I, I have this like confidence ellipsoid and I can prove that's like chapter 21 of the Bandit Algorithm book that like shows you how to prove this theorem uniformly in time and for any, you know, for any sequence of actions to prove that this ellipsoid contains the best parameter with high probability. Yes. What is S in the first line? Good question. S is the bound on the true norm of theta star. So like I said, uh, yeah, actions are bounded. Like there is some, some, and here the norm of this is S, like that's the maximal form of theta and, and the actions. Right. Um, and perhaps what is not visible here is that the noise, I have said that the noise is sub-Gaussian the noise would be normally sigma sub Gaussian and the sigma would appear in the radius here, but like here it's one, so it's it's hidden, but like it's here. Um, I think it's like in bandits, you know, like when you draw like UCB has a sigma, like the the, the standard deviation of the noise is in front of the square root um, that like stands for, you know, the, the, the amount of noise that you have in your observations so that would also appear here. Mm -hmm. I, at the beginning, well, you, yes. Good question. You would, we would assume we know S for now. S is a, is, S is a given parameter of my, my actions and my, my vector my, is, is bounded and I know S, I know the, the upper bound. And I also know sigma, the, the standard deviation of the, the reward function. But you know, that is true, that it may be a strong assumption. I am not sure who has played around with like estimating S. Does anyone know about this? Uh, yeah. Okay. You should know an upper bound on your rewards, but yeah, but like, W could you estimate it, or could, could you like on like with high probability? Could you say like I've only seen actions because the action sets you actually observe them all of them like all the actions, so like uh, you know at every round you get k observations of k vectors in dimension d, and maybe they have like you can you could say that like with high probability they have like they are bounded or something I don't know by something. Open question. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if Emily, you know about this. So I, I don't know about this, but when I implement this algorithm with my student on toy data sets, actually we played a lot with the beta we actually use. Like we totally remove S, we replace the square root by just a square root uh, log t over delta and Often it always it still works. So I see. I guess practitioner anyway play a lot with the beta they they use. So maybe yeah. sometimes they are lucky and that, that's 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 <laughs> also true. Um, so yeah, uh, just to 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 repeat because the sound went in and out. But basically, it's true that this like beta here that controls the radius of this these ellipsoids are nice for the theory, they allow us to prove that theorem, but in practice they are often a little bit conservative and like if you really want to like implement a linear CB that works, most people like remove some things in here, kind of 
play around or add a scaling factor in front so that like things work 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 better so it's you know that is true that like yeah, the dependence on s in theory is a in very interesting open question i don't know in practice might not make a huge difference okay so um now i need to implement the new cp with this um first I'm like, okay, I have a beta that have a log determinant of VT over lambda D. I'm like, okay, I need to, to compute a determinant at every iteration. So it's nice because it means that my radius actually exactly depends adaptively on the action set, but it's not nice because I need to compute this, this quantity. So what people do, like what, you know, what makes this algorithm implementable in the first place is to upper bound this thing. And it is actually a clever lemma that's called elliptical potential lemma. It's known in online learning for quite a long time. We've, uh, we've even like kind of studied this question a little bit of like the tightness of this elliptical potential lemma in like a little archive note. But anyway, the way it works is simply to like upper bound this log determinant via like uh, like in like little algebraic manipulations of the of the actions um, in in the in the, in VT, and you obtain a d log t kind of quantity, and that gives you a beta plus that you can actually compute at, compute at every round, and you know you can even pre-compute everything. That that's it, and it's not adaptive to the action set anymore, but it's close enough, and it's relatively tight. Um, and now I can compute linear CB. So I can, again, this is, uh, I made the same mistake here because it's just a copy paste. But so I have a new ellipsoid that's a little bit larger that, that controls the distance between the, my estimator theta hat and any vector. And for to, pull, to do linear CB, what I have to do is for each action in my action set, I compute an optimistic scalar product by maximizing a linear function for any theta that is within some distance of my estimator. And this is maximizing a linear function in a convex set, so we know how to do it. Ah, that's, I see Gergo, that's like, oh. Do we really know? It's uh, okay. <laughs> um, I agree. We don't, in general, always know. But it so happens that this problem, you can actually write it down and write the Lagrangian, and do your do your job with the convex optimization book of uh, Boyd on the side and follow the steps, and it's gonna work and it's gonna spit out the exact solution for you linear CB in this closed form here. So. Usually, when I give this class in like master's courses, I actually have a slide and stuff where I show how to resolve this, but I removed it for like because it's early in the morning. But like, it's actually a nice, it's a nice little like convex optimization exercise to to come up with this. And here, what do we see? So we see that linear CB is maximizing just the greedy scalar product plus beta, the, ra the radius of the ellipsoid, times the vt lambda minus one norm of the action. So it's a directional norm of, of, the, the, of the vector a that you're looking at. So we compute this index for each action in the, in, in the action set. And here I need to, oh, Um, here I need to invert the VT lambda matrix at every round. Uh, so that's a little bit painful. Uh, and in general, like, you know, in practice, you can use uh, this nice uh, uh, Morrison, for the Sherman Morrison formula that gives you like an update of the minus one matrix when there you do a rank one update. So that's like the practice trick, but it's still like a lot of matrix multiplication to compute these norms at every round. So computationally speaking, this is a little bit, you know, especially in high dimension, this poses quite some problems. But it is like, I can call it computationally efficient. Yes. Very good question. I do. I assume that the action set is finite 
and small. So that's the question. What is you know like it? It's a k. K is roughly a bit bigger, but not a bit bigger than D. That makes what what makes the problem interesting. Because like you have several actions. You know like in my little. In my little example here in dimension two, like you have k actions and this action and this action are correlated. So if you pull this one, you get information on all of them. But like k, k is small. And actually, if you make k very large, it becomes painful to compute this for every action all the time. And if k is infinite, I actually don't know an algorithm that optimizes this. And I think, unless I'm mistaken, this is an open problem. There is no, like, we don't know a polynomial algorithm that solves this problem when the action set is infinite or conti yeah, a continuous action set. Let's say, like, I have, like, my action set is all of a certain part of, of RD. I don't know how to solve this. So, yeah, very important. The action set here is finite. The capital L here, the norm of the actions. Okay, so um, okay, the S is the norm of theta, and usually S and L are the same. Um, I took the notation from the Bandit book where they they use the like two different letters. Uh, I think in most Bandit papers, this is the same, and it's going to be you know one. Uh, but yeah, more questions. Okay, so um, we have a nice algorithm. Um, we can prove regret bounds. How do we prove regret bounds? It works very similarly to UCB. So there is the UCB trick, and then like you upper bound. So, okay, UCB trick. We have the regret. The regret is just the sum of instantaneous regret, where you, you have the difference between the mean, the, the true value of the best action and the true value of the action you took. But it so happens that the true value of the best action is bounded with high probability by its UCB, which is bounded by definition of the algorithm by the UCB of the action you pulled, because you pulled the largest UCB. And then, like, this is equal to, like, some vector theta tilde uh, scalar product, um, and this theta tilde is close to the true value of theta. So I'm going to upper bound the simple, like the, the instantaneous regret by this new scalar product that comes from like manipulating these equations and this equation. And I upper bound by some form of Cauchy-Schwarz where I inserted some VT matrices in, inside the scalar product here. And I obtain, you know, um, basically this radius to beta um, times the, the norm of the action. And then you can calculate and you can obtain the regret bound from the, the betas, like summing the betas and summing these things. Um, and upper bounding the sum of the AT norms or like, or like over all Ts. This is where the elliptical potential lemma comes in. Um, yeah, I think I wanted to spare you the the I wanted to spare you the calculations here. Um, what we should, what we know about, what we want to like the the key the key take home message on this regret bounds is that uh, the regret is bounded by d square root n. That that's the main leading term um, plus some term in square root n d. Okay. This is a regret that depends on delta. So here I have set some delta a priori in my algorithm, and my regret bound is depending on delta. But like you can, you can make it, you know, like you can make delta in something like one over t or one over n here, and like obtain the the, the regret bound like uh, in expectation. Uh, but okay, I think. Um, uh, what are the comments? Okay, first comments. This is this proof can be kernelized quite easily, and you would obtain like Gaussian process bandits, like bandits, this GP UCB algorithm. Another thing is, 
this first this this dependency in d square root n here it's true for any action set it's a minimax regret bound so like if you don't want to make any assumption on the action sets that are coming to you you will get this in general but in practice you know there are action sets that we know have so smaller a smaller linear regret a smaller regret can you can you think of one and you think of a problem where, you know, in general, the regret, the minimax regret is smaller than this. Yes, a standard banded problem. If you have k arms in dimension k, okay. So let's start over again. Um, so to kind of slowly restart, first of all, I realized that like I went relatively fast. So like if there are questions and things like don't hesitate to, we can, we have time to go back on things. I wanted to demonstrate a bit how the linear bandit algorithm works. So um, this, this UC, new CB, so we, here we have a, like a problem in dimension two, the true mean is this black dot on the on the diagonal. And I've already, there's already been 19 time steps. So here we have the actions. So the actions are the green dots. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of them around, and they are like their norm is bounded as well. Okay. Just gonna give one minute for everyone to sit down. You haven't missed anything. The movie hasn't started yet. <laughs> Still the ads. <laughs> All right, so that's the more elaborate version of the little drawings that I had in my slides earlier, where now things are gonna move. So, um, my estimator after 19 time steps is this red dot. And I have, you know, uh, I, we, I mean, it's actually total credit to Tor Latimo who like did this video. So I have not done anything, Tor did it. But like, so here, um, the ellipsoid is kind of round around the, around the, the, the red dot because you know at the beginning UCB tends to take uniform actions anyway and there is the regularization. So we start with we start with this and the chosen arm is going to be uh, surrounded by a red dot. I'm giving you a lot of heads up because things go quite fast. So like be ready. <laughs> okay, it's I can I can also replay it. I could also try to play it a bit slower. Uh, okay, let me see. Normal, <laughs> yes. I just like from even like from this screen, I don't see super well. Okay, maybe the zero point seventy five is going to be enough. All right. <laughs> nice. Seriously. <laughs> Why am I connected though? Let me just redo this. Yeah, let's go. Really? Huh, and now it's here. How can I send this to the other screen? <laughs> ah, yes, I know. I need to first do this and then take it here. Intense. Let's just make it bigger. <laughs> I feel like a grandma. 
Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> now it should work, and I'm not sure if I can make it slower. So, like, buckle up. It's gonna be. <laughs> it's gonna go fast. All right. So the time steps are running here, and you see the uh, the chosen arm is this red dot. And look at the pattern. So it's almost always choosing the the optimal action, which is this action aligned with with theta, with the largest you know the largest reward. And once in a while, it just like goes and pick an action that's kind of orthogonal to it. So we're gonna re replay this. There are a few things to look at as well. Like look at the ellipsoid shape. So like we anticipated earlier, it really gets ill-conditioned into this direction of largest, like the largest uncertainty, which is also the lowest reward. So it's really like a design, like by, by design of this algorithm, the, uh, it tends to it tends to make an ellipsoid that has this shape. Okay, maybe one one last time for. And the regret actually goes very slowly. So we, ha we had 11 at the beginning after 19 time steps. And now, you know, we really accumulate regret extremely slowly. So this is also due to the fact that, you know, actions, actions here are actually fixed. So there is no changing action, uh, changing action spaces and they nicely spanned regularly you know, with large norms, they actually nicely span the action, the, the action uh, space. So that problem is actually not, you know, the worst case. Um, so things, you know, the, the regret actually doesn't grow that that fast. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, um, okay. So you know that, like in UCB, Emily, I don't know. Did you show the UCB video? Okay. So in UCB, you have um, you have the like f f for the the best arm, the concentration, the the the, the, inter the confidence interval becomes very very small, and for Worse arms, the, con the confidence interval became um, stays very large, and the upper bounds tend to align, you know, on the so on the value of the of the best arm kind of thing. So that's the intuition here, in the sense that like now we don't have only two actions orthogonal; we have a bunch of actions, and our and like our best action is the one that goes this direction. So the 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 radius of the ellipsoid in this direction is expected to become small because this the because the UCB is just the the norm of this action when you compute the norm by like weighting the value of the coordinates of the vector according to how much information you have in this in this direction so that's maybe i should uh, like I'm I'm trying to not not you know rely too much on the formula, but eventually you know that's kind of how how things. Um, okay, so you see here what is important in the UCB is the norm of the action when you weight all the coordinate of this vector according to the uh, e uh, the eigenvalues of this matrix here, which is an inverse covariance matrix. We're gonna kind of slowly walk through it. Assume that this matrix is diagonal. So it stores, like it's just, you know, every time you pull an action in direction D, you increase, that's here. If I pull the vector, ED, like with like a coordinate, or EI with a coordinate, a coordinate in 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 the I position. This AS AS transpose is just a big matrix like this with a one on the diagonal on I I the I I term, right? 
I just increase this this AA transpose is just a, a, this diagonal matrix with just one. So it's going to increase the value of the eigenvalue of VT into this direction. Okay, so this the eigenvalues of this matrix AA transpose count the amount of information, count the number of samples I have in this D, di D dimensional space, in this D directions of the, the, eigen, the, the eigen basis of this D dimensional space. So the eigenvalues of VT can be understood as this NA of T, the number of times you pull action A, except that like here, there are many action A's and they span, uh, they span this, so I have to not count how many I pulled this action, but I count how much I, they, they gave me information in the various directions of the space. That's the rough kind of intuition. Like this, the eigenvalues of this matrix are my action counts. And when I invert the matrix, I have one over one over N. And because here, it's like, it's just the norm here. This is actually a one over square root N. Like this is like a physicist analysis of what's happening here. <laughs> but like roughly, like uh, this is homogeneous to beta T being like some square root log T something, and square root D log T. It's homogeneous for an action A to square root D log T over square root N, roughly number of times you pull this action. It's actually not exactly this, it's like roughly the amount of information you have for it. And so what happens in this video is that we see, you know, how the ellipsoid kind of is shrunk in the directions where this covariance matrix has a large eigenvalue and larger where it has a smaller eigenvalue. Does that make sense? It's a, it's a lot like a hand wavy explanation, but um, yeah, it's actually more kind of a visual thing. It it also writes down quite well. Like if you write down this optimization problem, and you can you can see how things play out. Okay. Okay, so that was for linear CV. And we left with this question that like, when you have K arms and they are orthogonal to each other, we know that UCB, just UCB, would get a minimax regret of square root KN. And here I have a D square root N, which seems to be larger. So, the short story, the long story short, is that this problem, the K arm bandit, is actually a bit like simpler in a way uh, than having arbitrary action spaces popping up with just like this constraint that the actions are bounded, and that like when you are dealing with arbitrary action spaces, you have to be a bit more cautious, kind of with what you're doing, but uh, in practice, when you have finite action spaces, you can you can exploit the structure of the action space a bit better and gain the square root DN regret. So we just saw the video. Um, I'm going to first go through Thompson sampling before, uh, before uh, going into the finite action space um, just to give you an alternative uh, to, to linear CV. Um, you've seen Thompson sampling, I guess, yesterday. Yes. You've seen Thompson sampling already for the usual, uh, usual K-arm bandits. And again, it's going to work very similarly for, for linear bandits, except that now we have to sample from a D-dimensional posterior, which in some cases might actually not be that easy. But you can make nice assumptions like for example, that like you gave a, a Gaussian prior and you exploit linear Bayesian uh, regression to obtain a Gaussian posterior. So same here as before, um, I have 
a fixed action set. Actually, I don't have to have a fixed action set. It could just be an action set. Um, but yeah, oh, we are going. I assume that just now the noise, instead of being sub Gaussian, it is Gaussian. So I can use Gaussian, you know, prior, posterior updates. And the algorithm is very simple. You give it a prior here, Gaussian prior, and at every round you run linear Bayesian, you run an update of the linear Bayesian regression, you know, uh, usual things, which is extremely similar to what we've done so far. And you sample a theta t from the posterior, from this Gaussian posterior that you obtain. And the action you choose is the action that has the largest, uh, like, scalar product um, with, you know, the sampled parameter theta. So it's very similar in idea to what we're seeing here. You could see this as like, you know, the like the level line of this like posterior distribution that you have. So you have to imagine like it's a it's a bell shaped curve and you have this like so like fixed probability line for, for this bell shaped bell shaped curve. It gives you an ellipsoid. And instead of like maximizing a scalar product in there, you just sample theta and just pull the action that has the largest scalar product with a sample from this region. So it's going to be, you know, a sample you have to imagine, like, like high probabilities around the expected, around the, the this is like the, the mean a posteriori, like the, and then like smaller probabilities to sample theta around, like in, in further away uh, regions of the ellipsoid, but that's really the same idea. So you sample the theta and you, pull the action that maximizes the scalar product. And okay. okay, so very simple algorithm. The advantage, the main advantage, is that you don't have to compute this A norm, like the, the norm of the action with like the VT minus one matrix. So it's really nice. Um, but you have to sample from a posterior which in the Gaussian case, when the model is linear, is gonna all work really nicely. But in, but, you know, in many cases, it might not be that easy to sample from a posterior. So we, we use heavily, you know, all sorts of uh, machinery, like, you know, conjugate priors, but also like Laplace approximations and, and things like this in like more complex models. Um, and, um, People, like there are different ways of analyzing this. You can make a frequentist analysis, but you can also propose to like study the Bayesian regret of Thompson sampling, where here the Bayesian regret adds an, an, like an, an expectation over the prior that you gave to your the, that you gave to your algorithm. So this is saying, look, I know that my parameter theta was sampled from some prior Q and I'm going to feed my algorithm this prior Q and it's going to update its belief according to using the observation to like estimate theta. And now you're saying on average over all the potential environments from this prior, what is the regret? So it's another way of studying, of studying, you know, bandit algorithms. Um, and for Thomson sampling, it's, it seems like kind of a, a bit of a natural way. And you would get something like a, a D square root N Bayesian regret. But for the frequentist analysis that you can also do for, for linear Thomson sampling, we get a D to the three half square root N. Um, so when the noise is like has some like bound and like the, the variance of the noise is, is like bounded by something of the order of D. So um, this D to the three half adds a square root D compared to like the, the regret of Lin UCB. So where we said that like the minimax regret is D square root N. And it is not known whether this is an artifact of the proof or if it's like more conceptually like, you know, it's something that, you know, belongs to the nature of Thompson sampling that it's minimax regret, frequentist minimax regret is actually larger than the one of Lin UCB. 
it is not, I don't think it's been verified in practice that there exists a problem for which, you know, there is no lower bound, like there's no construction of any problem for which Thompson sampling would have like a D to the three half regret. So I don't know. I, and I think it's still an open question whether this D to the three half is, is, uh, is real or not. Okay, so that's for Thompson sampling. And I think it's just a very natural way to like, you know, do something different from linear CB, like to implement, I wouldn't say optimism, but like, like put in the algorithm, the uncertainty that you have around the estimator of the, of the environment parameter. Yes? No, there are there are assumptions. There are assumptions on the coverage. So what is it again? Uh, that's a good question, actually. Um, no, there there are there are there are some assumptions on like the 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 kind of coverage of the the true parameter. Like no, because this is that doesn't doesn't make sense. I am not sure. There are assumptions. They are not very strong, but there are assumptions on this prior, and I I am blanking. Yeah, sorry. Good question. If anyone knows what is like the typical assumption for the prior here, it's a technical thing. It's just like essentially to make. So the way the proof works is that. You manipulate these expectations, like this, you, these different expectations, to like condition nicely and everything, so that you make UCB appear. Like you bring back the proof of UCB, the optimism, into you know you prove, kind of say okay, uh, with high probability, basically the sample is going to be smaller than the UCB, and then like you, you bring back in the analysis of UCB. You average over all this, and you you and you that gives you the same rate. And for the inverts, inverting the expectation, the integrals and conditioning, you need some assumptions on the prior. That's kind of the the basic idea, but uh, I'm not exactly sure what's the key thing that you need. Yeah. So the prior is not gonna like the prior is not gonna decay, but like the posterior for sure, for sure, in a sense, like, like there's concentration of measure. So, but I'm not sure what you need, you know, for this concentration of measure thing to exactly like work well. But you're right, it's something like this. You want you want the, to be able to apply this kind of concentration arguments eventually. Yeah, which is gonna work because like the noise is Gaussian, so. It should should all work, but like I'm not sure what I I'm blanking on the exact thing. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, um, so like the question is whether this is related so to select some question, some typical techniques in active learning, where you're saying that they obtain regrets in square root d n instead of d square root n. So, I am not sure about the first part. Like, I mean, I hundred percent, you know, bandit al like this type of bandit algorithms are connected very strongly to what people do in active learning. Uh, you know, Bayesian optimization and, and GPU CB and all these these algorithms share a lot of like 
uh, similarities, like in design and um, I don't know, like, so that connects nicely to the initial question that we had posed for, for a bit to talk about Thompson sampling, but there is still this question of regret bound in D square root N versus square root DN. To obtain a square root DN, I would kind of assume that like, they make some other assumption on their action space, like something fixed or something, or something with a fixed distribution. Like if you say that like your action space is actually just sample from some distribution with like a control covariance matrix with nice uh, with nice eigenvalues that also gives you square root d n kind of bounds. So I'm I'm not sure I can't really answer very clearly your question because I'm not sure what algorithm you're referring to, but it's very likely that there is a link between these two things. Okay. Um, so that actually connects quite well. So what happens when you have a fixed action set? You have k actions and they are just fixed from the beginning on. You actually know what they are. And there is, they span nicely, you know, the, the space, meaning that, well, you know what is the lowest eigenvalue. Okay, and it's going to be part of you know the, the your the difficulty of your problem. But overall, you know, like you know you know in advance, and this uh, smallest eigenvalue is not arbitrarily small, or it's not like worst case small. Um, and well, in these finite action action spaces, there is a paper by Tor and Chaba from 2017 that is called "The End of Optimism," and something something. Um, and this paper, The End of Optimism, which is always hard to Google, because when you Google The End of Optimism, you find a lot of other things. <laughs> but uh, if you, if you uh, like, yeah. So what, is, what does this paper say? It says, if I have a finite action set, I can design a hard problem for which Lin UCB has an arbitrarily large regret when you look at the regret in a problem-dependent way. So if you look at the regret as a function, like I have not really introduced this problem-dependent uh, version of the regret, but you've seen it yesterday, you know, the regret in log t over delta kind of, kind of things. You can define the exact same, you know, definition of the regret when you have a finite action space, because now the covariance of the matrix, the gaps mean something. There's, there's a fixed gaps between the best action and the second best, it exists. Whereas when you have arbitrary action spaces, the, the gaps change all the time. So now I have a fixed problem. I have gaps. I can define a, dep a problem-dependent regret. And I can show that there exists a problem with a fixed action, a fixed action space for which Lin UCB, you can make it explode by like varying a small parameter. And so the question that they ask is like, OK, so what is a good algorithm to explore the space to minimize the regret, especially this problem-dependent kind of regret, when I have a fixed action space. Is there another way of minimizing the regret since Lin UCB is failing? And the idea is to use a tool from statistics that's called optimal experimental design. So optimal design is when you, um, you have this fixed action space and you're going to find the proportions of pools of each actions such that the overall ellipsoid that you get has the best determinant of the smallest, the smallest volume. So you, nice, you optimize the information in all directions such that you can sequentially eliminate actions. So it's the same thing as like phased eliminations in, in UCB, but now I have like actions in like several directions of the space. So I'm gonna pull actions in a kind of, you can think of it as like uniform way, but it's, here it's not uniform because I may have like three actions pointing this way and one action pointing this way. So if I want to have a uniform ellipsoid, I need to pull one third these ones or one fourth these ones and one fourth this one, this one. So that like the overall uncertainty in all directions is kind of nice and uniform. And then I can erase actions in phases. So that's the algorithm that they propose, like a type of algorithm that they propose in, in, in this paper. Well, in that paper exactly, 
they propose something a bit more complicated that that uses like tracking lower bounds and like kind of more more advanced ideas but the 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 principle of this type of method is to optimize on the, the design choices, the, the action choices, to get an ellipsoid that is that doesn't become like, you know, ill-conditioned in this direction by design, but like controls better, like the uncertainty in all directions, so you can sequentially uh, eliminate actions. And if you do this, so if you if you do optimal design plus phased elimination. Then in this type of like fixed uh, fixed action set, first you can bound the problem dependent regret for any uh, any problem. So that I didn't write, but that's that's what they prove in this uh, in this uh, paper. But also in the worst case, you get a square root n d log k uh, regret. So that's good. The problem is you cannot apply this kind of techniques in like a changing, an arbitrary changing action space. Like there's no algorithm that like if I inten instantiate it for a finite action, then it's like, it does, uh, it has square root ND regret. And if I instantiate it for, you know, um, like arbitrary action, then it has the D square root N regret. So for a very long time, there wasn't this algorithm that like uh, is the not best of both worlds because it's not exactly what it is, but like that that nicely, you know, navigates these these two settings uh, seamlessly and so that was a that was a, a question for a long time and the answer is that yes there is actually so there has been um, there is a first work by um, by Thierry et al in 2020 and just like after Johannes Kirchner, Torla Timor and myself and Chaba we we worked on like an um, information directed sampling version so like both algorithms kind of solve this problem they they, they propose like a an like a, um, an approach that if you instantiate it in either case they are going to get the, the best of minimax regret but um like empirically the primal dual algorithm is not so good it needs a lot of like hand tuning our algorithm is like a slightly easier to tune I mean, eventually, you know, it's it's kind of kind of similar similar uh, s similar results. But so, yeah, this problem is uh, no longer that open. Like, there are some some corner cases that could be could be cut, like some second order terms and things. But like, yeah. Okay, I think we're reaching the end. Actually, quite well on time. Um, so, you know, like we had a problem. We had this like structured action space, different customers and different you know different movies, and now we have a way to uh, encode these contexts and actions into contextualized action spaces, and to based on these linear assumptions on the reward, we can uh, we we can learn the reward function across actions, and act uh, to minimize regrets, and we do have most you know regret bounds like up like up to sm second order terms we have the minimax optimality for almost all the algorithms except this open problem that um that like remains so like there are um there there are still open problems in in this in this field um first thompson sampling the d to the three half uh you can also like there are there are lots of uh, Questions that remain beyond linear bandits. Like if you if you look with if you work with harder models, like even logistic bandits have actually posed a lot of problems uh, in 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 practice and in theory. So very recent paper uh, by Fauri et al. Abe et al. Uh, on uh, on generalized linear models. Neural bandits also they we have some things, but we don't have that much. Um, Sparse models where, like you know, like I said, the d the d dimensional space is not fully covered. Like it's uh, there, there's a lot of zero, zeros. Like Botao and Tor have have uh, papers on this. I also recommend the recent tutorial by Dylan Foster on contextual bandits, where they go beyond the linear model and they study in general the sample complexity of decision making. Like really good line of work. And yeah, there are some active uh, topics of research, uh, you know, from 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 more theoretical questions to more like concrete applied questions of what happens in like non-stationary environments and sparse 
uh, sparse cases and like you know uh, in in, in uh, Dylan Dylan's line of work sample complexity of terror, like of decision making also lots of open questions so like even if there are lots of things that we understand uh, there are still very uh, exciting areas of research for you to dig in and I thank you for your attention and I wish you a good coffee break <laughs> I think that we have time for a couple of questions if... Sure, if there are burning questions, I'm very happy to take them. Hi. So, so far we have seen that the action space is fixed, but in some cases you have like, let's say the movie one, that new movies appears or some content are just shown for a given period. So my question is, how can we use these techniques or this approach when the action space also change over time? So actually, quite naturally, so as long as your movies, like or whatever new items in the catalog can be embedded in the same action space as the previous ones, like, you know, like this technical thing, but um, let me see. Um, All right, this phi here, this function, as long as you can apply it to your new customer and your new action, they're in the same, they are, you know, they, in your machine, they look the same. As long as you can represent them and embed them, you can just make, it just gives you a new d-dimensional vector that is going to appear, you know, as in your action set at the next round. I'm assuming that you know the, the number of actions remain bounded. Like I've always said, there are k actions, but these actions can change. You can think of it actually. That's how most real world real world system work. There is the customers. There is the entire catalog, and you have a first classifier that cuts off most of your catalog and decides on like the k most likely actions or a k uh, and a set of k vectors, a k of items in your catalog that are a bit diverse, but things that you usually like. And then there's a bandit algorithm on top of it that like selects from these K actions that selects the one that you want to present. Actually, there are most of the time, it's a ranking bandit algorithm. It's going to select the first, the second, the third, and it makes your YouTube next, watch next recommendations. That's, I mean, you know, there, I'm not disclosing any secret. Like, how would you, how would you build a system? Like, you would do this, right? Like, you have an infinite amount of videos. You first have like classifiers, like black box things that your teams of engineers have built. They they remove things, and then you still have to make a choice. And that's how it happens. So, adding things and removing things is okay, but at, to the to to the extent that you need to filter out at some point some of the actions. I mean, the way you filter, that's uh, like that's kind of beyond the scope. Like, I don't know how, like they are actually, you know, this is updated all the time. The way you filter actions, the way you, like there is, there is no a priori hierarchy, but you know, you could say that like some, like some profiles of customers never watch some types of videos. And so these are never gonna be given to the bandit algorithm to make decisions with. It's not interesting for them. In a sense, like you're, you're saying, there is a very, very large d-dimensional space. I'm gonna cut everything except for like ten dimensions, like I cut ev all the actions that are not interesting for my my customers or for my my customer right now. This this kind of ideas. More questions. I mean, if not right now, I'm gonna be around actually until Wednesday. So yeah, you can like come and come and ask your questions and say hi. Um, and uh, is there any last minute thoughts? No, I think it can be coffee time. Let's just uh, call it a day, yeah. Cheers.